Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. What I wanted to really talk to you about today is, is something that I think is particularly uh, dear to my heart, which is, is why do we do basic research? I mean, what is the role of basic research in the sort of broader technology space? And I really want to distinguish basic research from things like advanced technology or development uh, for the purposes of this talk. Now, let me start by, by taking us back uh, a little bit more than 20 years ago. Microsoft in 1990 was a very small company. Uh, and yet it did something that I think is very extraordinary, which is it, it made a choice, and the board of directors of Microsoft made a, made a decision that it wanted to invest in the creation of a fundamental basic research laboratory. Now, that's a pretty difficult decision for a small company to make. In 1990 was a, was a point when Microsoft first had a billion dollars in sales. That sounds like a lot, but that's a very small company to be doing long-term fundamental basic research. It only had a few products, you know, mostly in retail it really was not the kind of company you think of Microsoft being today. And yet it decided that it was important for itself to look forward to the long term and to make an investment in science and in fundamental technology. Now, I, that's where I came in. Um, I joined Microsoft at, uh, at September 1st of 1991, so almost 20 years ago. And I was brought in specifically to create that basic research organization, the thing that we now call Microsoft Research. Before that, I was a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh for 12 years. And my own work there was primarily in operating systems. But Microsoft wanted me to come and create a broad spectrum basic research organization. Now my model for basic research was really the model that I had when I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And I turned that into a mission statement, which has been the mission statement of Microsoft Research from the very beginning to today. And there's three parts to that mission statement. The first and the most important part is that it's our mission to move forward the state of the art in the areas we do research. Now what's interesting about that is that actually says nothing about Microsoft. I mean that part of the mission statement doesn't say, you know, we want to do work for Microsoft, or we want to make something that Microsoft's going to use, or something of that sort. It says, if we're going to do basic research in an area, we're going to do the best basic research possible, and we're going to move that state of the art forward. Now the reason that that's our sort of first mission is frankly, if my feeling was if we weren't going to do that, we really wouldn't be that valuable. We need to be the best at what we do. We need to really be pushing forward that frontier. Now when we do, I mean, when we're successful, that brings to bear the second part of our mission statement, which is when we have great ideas that pan out, I mean, we, we have a lot of ideas that don't, but when we have an idea that pans out, when, we, when we've taken something and created a technology, we then work very hard to move those ideas into our products as rapidly as possible. That all leads to the third part of our mission statement, which fundamentally is re really a recap of the first two. And that's to make sure that Microsoft and the field of technology have a future. Because if we don't do those first two things, they won't. So since 1991, when we had basically one employee, uh, we've grown quite a bit. I mean, today, Microsoft Research is 
850 PhD researchers operating all over the world. You can see from the slide here sort of the ramp, you know, over a period of time. Now to put that 850 researchers in perspective, that basically means we're about the size of 18 or 19 Berkeley PhD computer science faculties. Uh, so we're a very large institution in the sense of, of you know, having a large number of top rank publishing PhD computer scientists. To put it in a slightly different perspective, this represents about 1% of all of Microsoft's employees. So we're investing 1% of our workforce in PhD researchers doing fundamental science. Now we're a very distributed organization. In fact, uh, more people work for me outside the United States than work for me inside the United States. And you can see in the chart here, you know, not only the six basic research labs we have, but also our innovation centers uh, in Aachen, Germany, in Cairo, our joint research center in, uh, uh, in Paris with INRIA, uh, and many of the uh, collaborative research centers that we've helped to establish and fund in, in universities around the world. Now, when I, when I came to Microsoft, you know, my model of what a basic research organization should be and what it should do was really the model that I carried with me from Carnegie Mellon. I mean, basically, my view was that I wanted to have something that looked like the, my, the, the Carnegie Mellon computer science department in the mid-1980s. I wanted to have something that was like that, but that sat within the context of Microsoft, of a, of a large software company, or large or at least growing software company. And so I adopted many of the structures and many of the approaches from Carnegie Mellon you know, into what I did uh, at Microsoft. So we have a relatively flat, at least as flat as you can have for 850 person organization, uh, relatively flat organizational structure. I believe in having critical mass groups in each research area. I don't believe in saying I want one or two smart people in each, each topic. I want to make sure I have enough people working in each area that they can share ideas and interact with each other um, and work to really make change happen in their particular field. An absolutely critical component of Microsoft research, but frankly it's obviously a critical component of the academic community, is to have an open research environment. So we aggressively publish the work that we do just as you all do within your universities. In fact, Microsoft Research is one of the top publishing organizations today in the field of computer science. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We also have frequent visitors. We're a very open environment. We bring in visitors on either on a daily basis, weekly. We have people that, that spend six months to a year on their sabbaticals working with us. And again, we, we believe that's critically important uh, for the kind of intellectual environment that we want to build. And, and I think this, this event is an example of this, we fundamentally believe in, the, in having strong, basic research going on in universities. And so, be, so, from the beginning of Microsoft Research, now almost 20 years ago, we've devoted more than 15% of all the money that Microsoft has invested in basic research directly to universities, either in the form of faculty grants, uh, research grants, student fellowships, uh, laboratories, uh, and then supporting events like this that bring people together within the community to be able to share ideas and best practices and really, really interact with each other. The last line here that talks about interns is, is even more critical, I think. We believe that it's important for us to work directly with students around the world. We run the largest PhD inter internship program, certainly in the technology industry, it may be the largest ever. Uh, we have over a thousand PhD interns 
working at some part of Microsoft research every year. Just in our research lab in Redmond alone, this summer we'll have more than 350 PhD interns. To, give you, to put that in perspective, that, that's more PhD students than almost any university has uh, in computer science. And so it, this is both a tremendous resource for us because it brings these incredibly bright, incredibly energetic young people from, frankly, all over the world together. It's a great thing for the students because they have a chance to work with our researchers, which are some of the top researchers in the world. But one of the big benefits, frankly, is the, is the bonds that it creates, both between the students, because now we have students from all over the world in one place interacting so they get to interact with each other and develop relationships that are going to carry forward throughout their academic careers and also the bonds it creates between Microsoft research and the academic community because the students go back to their universities and they bring with them you know the knowledge of 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 us um, and they take then they give us knowledge of what happens in the university environment. So it brings and connects people together. It becomes kind of a human glue. Now I said we really, there are two parts of our mission statement. You know, there's the expand the state of the art, and then there's the, the get technologies out into the world. Uh, there are lots of different ways to measure expand the state of the art. This, you know, I'm not going to suggest that we count papers as a way of doing that. But I just wanted to, to, to give you a sense of how much we publish and the impact it has in the academic literature. I mean, these, this is some, you know, some data from 2009. You know, those numbers have continued to go up. Typically today in major international conferences in the fields in which we work, we'll have anywhere between 15 to 35 percent of all the papers will have an author from Microsoft Research. So we're really having a significant impact, and we, and we believe in being part of that community, in, in participating in the journals, participating in the, in the committees, uh, participating in the, in the scientific activities in the societies. But we also work really hard to get our ideas into products. You know, I've talked about that. There's lots of ways we do that. Uh, we have a group of people whose job it is just to do that. Uh, these, this is a program management team that works with researchers, they work with our product groups, they understand the product teams and their schedules and, and what their concerns are, they work with the researchers and understand the technologies that are being developed, and they really help to create a marriage uh, between those, to act as go-betweens uh, and human glue that connects our researchers with our product teams. Lots of things. I'm going to talk specifically about some, some particular um, examples of technologies. But, but almost anything you can think of as micro, that is Microsoft today has been influenced by Microsoft research. And many of the key parts of Microsoft that you see today came from Microsoft research. So, for example, you know, I started a group in the early days, in the ni early 1990s, 1992, 1993, looking at, at, at streaming media and interactive television. That then evolved to become what was the digital media division of Microsoft, and I led that in its early days. I led the DirectX team, which are the 3D graphics component of Windows in the early days, because so many of the technologies that were driving that effort came out of Microsoft research. That, of course, led to the creation of things like the Xbox, and. And Microsoft researchers have been intimately involved in the Xbox, you know, from its earliest days in helping to create Xbox Live and the underlying graphics technologies that make it work. I started the first e-commerce group in the company. Uh, so many of the things you think of, the natural language and speech technologies in our Office products and our Windows products, all spun out of Microsoft research. So, so many of the things you think of today as being Microsoft really, really began in that way. I'm not going to go through lists, but we have lots of big lists of, of, of products. Now, let me get back to what I really wanted to say about what is the value of basic research? Because, and, and this is something that I think is, is often misunderstood. 
Um, even, I think, to some extent within the academic community, we sometimes don't do a good job of communicating the value of what we do and talking about it properly. Now, when people talk about basic research, you know, uh, especially in the press, um, they often talk about what I would characterize as the byproducts of basic research. And they think that's what basic research is or what it does. So when they say, you know, what's the value of basic research, or they, you know, someone says, what's the value of Microsoft research? You know, what you'll hear, I think, frequently is people will say, oh, I know what it is. You know, uh, it's about intellectual property, right? Uh, it's about the patents and the technologies that you create. You know, and it's certainly true that an organization like Microsoft Research produces a lot of patents and a lot of intellectual property and a lot of technologies. I mean, Microsoft, uh, there was a uh, Business Week article about a year, year and a half ago that said that my, the value of Microsoft's intellectual, intellectual pro, uh, patent portfolio uh, was greater than any other company in the technology field by a lot. Uh, it also, there was uh, IEEE, you know, publishes studies of, of what they call the scientific strength of patents and, and we come out generally at the very top of that because of the value of, of the intellectual content uh, that we bring to our uh, patent portfolio from Microsoft Research. And of course we create a lot of technologies. I just showed you a couple of slides that, that go into our products and make a huge difference. But I would argue that the, that the that this part, the sort of this this IP and the technologies we create, it's a great thing. It's it's a byproduct of basic research, but it is not the output of basic research, and it is not why a company like Microsoft, or a country like Colombia, or a region like Latin America, um, or the world should invest in basic research. It's a great thing to get as a result. You know, as I often say, it pays the bills really well. But it isn't, it isn't the reason why we do it. You could say, okay, uh, if it's not that, I know, you, you solve problems. Right? You've got really smart people, you, you can take problems to them, and they're going to figure those problems out. And that's true. I mean, we do that. Uh, I love personally doing it. I love it when someone comes to me with a really, really hard problem, uh, and, and I can work on it. Right? That's fun. I mean, we're all trained. You know, all of us that have come through the university system, uh, gotten our PhDs, we're trained to solve problems. We were doing it, you know, all the way through our academic careers. And we love doing it. And, you know, the researchers in Microsoft love doing it too. The harder the problem, the better. But while that's a great thing, it's a great value, again, I would argue that by itself that's not why you have a basic research group. That's not why you invest in basic research. It's just an outcome. It's something that comes out the other end, but it's a byproduct of, of the fundamental enterprise. And you could also say, okay, well, if it's not those things, maybe it's your early warning system. Right? Maybe you can tell us what's going to happen in the future. In fact, when I talk to reporters, you know, they're always asking me what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I remember in uh, when we went you know, to 2000, you know, with the transition to 2000. And uh, everybody was talking about Y2K and, and they were all talking about the new millennium. And, and I got called up by a reporter. And the reporter says, I'm, I'm doing this story on what the world is going to be like in 20 years. And I, I'd like to have you, you know, give me your thoughts about what it's going to be like in 20 years. And I thought about, I thought about that a little bit. And I said, well, who else have you talked to? You know, and he said, well, let's see. I, I talked to a, uh, uh, a science fiction writer, and I talked to a, a futurist, and I, I talked to this guy that said he was a warlock, a wizard, whatever you want to call it. And I said, okay. Uh, well, I don't think I can probably do as well as those people because, I mean, fundamentally, I can tell you what's happening in science, you know, and I might be able to project what technologies might exist in 20 years, but, but I, I don't really have 
a good sense of what people are going to do with it. I mean, think back for a moment for yourself 20 years ago. Uh, we knew that we would be here today in terms of the, 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 the chips and the storage and everything else. I mean, we've had more, Moore's Law. There's lots of things that have been in the laboratories that you could say, okay, 20 years from now, this is what the world might look like. I've got some great slides from 20 years ago that are actually pretty good in terms of predictions of devices. I've got something that looks, you know, just like a, 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 a modern smartphone. I've got something that looks, you know, just like, you know, a modern tablet and modern laptops. And we talk about communication speeds. I could do that. But what's hard to predict is what's society going to do with it? You know, what, what are people going to do? I would never have guessed, for example, when the cell phone was created, that it would get used more to access the internet and to send text messages than, than to talk. You know, I would never have guessed that, you know, it was going to be used by young people as a dating mechanism, okay? Uh, it seemed like a communication technology of a very different kind. You know, I think that's sort of the, 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 the difficulties that we have when we're trying as scientists to predict the future. So I told the, this guy, I said, you know, my bet's on the warlock, you know, in terms of, of whether, whose prediction is likely to be the best um, out of that. But we can be an early warning system, right? Uh, we can say, you know, I think this, uh, this, this internet search thing is going to be big someday. That doesn't mean our product groups will listen to us, right? But we can say that, right? Um, but again, I think that, that, that that's a, it's a value, but it isn't why you do basic research. So what I would argue is that the fundamental reason you do basic research, whether it's in a company like Microsoft, or if it's in a country like Colombia or a region like Latin America, or whether it's you know, the world, uh, the reason we as a society should be investing in basic research is so we survive. It's a survival mechanism. I mean, it's, it, think of it as an insurance policy for the future. I mean, the value of, of, of Microsoft research to Microsoft is it gives the company the ability to change when change is absolutely necessary. If you go back to the writings of Vannevar Bush, uh, who is one of the people that helped to create the National Science Foundation in the United States, you see the same logic that he was applying. He was saying, we should invest in basic science and build our science infrastructure, not because it's going to create you know, lots of jobs and great businesses and make us a lot of money, although it probably will do that. But we should do it because we, we've just gone through, and he, he was writing right after World War II, you know, we've just gone through this terrible war where science was as much a key element of winning that war as the, milita you know, the, the basic military might of the various parties involved. And he said, look, we need to, if there's going to be another war, if there's going to be a famine, if there's going to be a terrible disease, we need to have the smart people, we need to have the, the, the sort of treasure chest of ideas and technologies. And we need to have it when we didn't know we were going to need it. But then we'll need it right then. Right? So we need to build that infrastructure of smart people and, and ideas and technologies so that we can survive those, those terrible circumstances, whatever they may happen to be. Well, for a company like Microsoft, it's really the same it's exactly the same thing, right? We could have a new competitor. We have them all the time. In my 20 years, we've had a bunch of them. We could have a, a fundamental shift in technology, and that's happened several times during my stay at Microsoft. You know, we could have a change in business climate. We just went through one of those. And we need, as a company, to be able to survive that. We need the agility, which means we need to be able to, to draw upon a, a base of, of, of really smart people who've probably already been working on those problems and can help the company change. Not just the technologies, but the people can help the company change and change its attitudes and change its perspectives and make 
the company different than it was before. And probably the biggest te the testament to the success of Microsoft Research is that Microsoft is still here. You know, almost none of the companies that were like Microsoft in 1990 are still here. And the few that are don't really look anything like what they did before and are not particularly successful. Even some really large companies from back in the 1990s in the technology field are gone. In fact, probably more companies are gone than are still here from that period. Survival in the technology space means constant, constant investment in innovation and change and basic research is a key component of that. Let me give you uh, a historical example. I don't talk about this a lot usually, but th this is a particularly interesting example of what it means to have invested in basic research and, and in some sense changed or saved your company. So going back to 1992, uh, we were doing research. I mean, very early days of Microsoft Research. I think we maybe had 20 people back then. But we were doing research in program analysis and, and looking at, at the, you know, how do I analyze software. And some of our researchers came up with a, a, a particular idea of how they could reduce the working set size of 32-bit programs, 32-bit applications. So for if, if, if that's not your area of research, what, I'm, what I meant by that is, is I could run a program and it would take a lot less memory as it was running. In this case, about half. So that was great. We thought this was pretty cool stuff. It's mostly math, right? It was mostly math. And we took it to our product teams. And we were, you know, we thought this was a great piece of technology. We went to our product teams. I sat with them on a big table and we had a discussion. We showed them our slides. Uh, and, and what they said was, you guys, you're really smart. Okay? That math stuff you just showed us, that, that looks really smart. But we don't have this problem. Right? First off, in 1992, most of Microsoft products teams didn't have 32-bit code. They only had 16-bit code. Right? This was 1992, not, you know, not some number of years later. But they were planning to move to 32-bit. So we said, but you're going to move to 32-bit. And they said, no, but that doesn't matter because you know, memory prices are just on this, 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 this you know, log curve going straight down. Right? So it, it, it won't make any difference anymore. Right? So you can save memory and it doesn't matter because memory is going to be so cheap, everybody's going to have way too much of it. All right, well, that was great. We believed in ourselves. We kept working on it. Three years later, Microsoft had its 32-bit versions of Windows and Office ready to go. And there was one problem. And the problem is on that slide up here. If you look, there's a, the set of dates, set of prices, it's on a log scale. You see that nice kind of generally straight line down, uh, except right around the, uh, the, the 19, 1995 area there, you notice that the prices that don't actually go down. Okay? And in fact, they, they tick up a little bit. Now, what was going on then? Well, there were some trade issues between the you know, U.S. and Asia, and there was some you know, collusion and various other things were going on. But the frank reality was it, did, it didn't really matter what was going on. The, the memory prices weren't going down. And so our product groups were now in a terrible problem because all their marketing information said the memory was going to go down, therefore it didn't matter that they had that 32-bit code that took up twice as much space. But it didn't happen. So they, they were going to have to ship 32-bit versions of Windows, you know, what became Windows 95, and Office, what became Office 95, into a marketplace where the computers were the same, had the same amount of memory, which was four or eight megabytes, uh, that they had a few years earlier when we released Windows 3.1. Those computers ran Windows 3.1, which was our 16-bit product, just great. They just wouldn't run Windows and Office together because they now took up too much space. Well, the good news is we have the technology to get back that factor of two they lost to move from 16 to 32-bit. We were able to bring that to them. 
We had perfected it in the meantime, made it so that it could fit into our development processes. And as a result, we were able to simultaneously ship Windows and Office in 1995 when otherwise we, we really wouldn't have been able to do it. There wouldn't have been anybody, it wouldn't have sold because nobody would have bought it because the product would have just ran horribly. Now, that meant several hundred million dollars in additional revenues that year to Microsoft, which, you know, in those days, a, a, a few hundred million dollars was actually real money. You know, you could take your family to the movie uh, with a few hundred million dollars. You know, you could, you, you'd pick it up if it was lying down on the floor, right? Now, in, especially in, in you know, Washington, D.C., when now everything's in tens of trillions, nobody really cares. But in those days, it was a big deal. Uh, but the more important thing was to the, to the future of Microsoft and to its survival was the fact that our primary competitors didn't have this technology. So Lotus and WordPerfect didn't have it. Uh, they couldn't ship their products because they didn't have it, they, didn't, they wouldn't fit. And even when they did ship about a year or so later, they took up too much space, they were slow. I mean, they, and, and uncompetitive. You know, if you go back and talk with like Ray Ozzie, who of course you know came eventually to work at Microsoft, he'll say, "Look, that killed us." And he knew we he knew we had the technology that he didn't. He just didn't know what it was, right? He didn't know how we did it. He just knew we were doing it. You know, so this is an example where fundamental basic research that frankly our product groups didn't even want, right? No one anticipated the need for it. In fact, they mostly just assumed it was never going to be of any value made an enormous strategic difference to a small company like Microsoft you know, and helped make it a larger company and eventually the company we have today. So this in some sense is an example of the sort of fundamental value of basic research. It's allowing you to adapt and change and survive when you might not otherwise have been able to do. And I think the same thing applies to, to countries. Now let me give you some examples of of research that we've done that have had an impact that, that you know, I'll, I'll show you examples of the, the, some of the research and also what, turned, what it turned into so you can get a sense of how, how the process sometimes works. So here's an example of a, a paper that was at SIGGRAPH in 2004 from Microsoft Research on something called uh, digital uh, photo montage. And the idea behind this you know, was, was pretty cool. Uh, if you, I mean, you all take pictures, you know, of your families at, at holidays. And the problem is that it's never a good picture, right? If you, the more relatives you have, the lower the probability is that you, ever, you get them all looking good at the same time, right? Until once you get about eight, I think it goes to zero, you know. Um, here's an example where somebody's looking away just as you're taking the picture, you know. Uh, this guy's looking okay, but this guy's looking away. All right, you take another picture, and now he looks great, you know, but he's got one of his eyes closed. Looks kind of goofy, okay? You know, grandma's looking the wrong way, right? Uh, you know, I don't know what's wrong with that guy, but the pe person who put the slide together for me uh, evidently thought there was something goofy looking about him. I think he just looks goofy. Uh, here's a boy's yawning, right? So th this is just the, the kind of thing you always see. So what the photo digital montage work did was to say, we'll take a bunch of pictures of the same thing, uh, sometimes perhaps under different lighting conditions or whatever, and we will merge, the, we will let the user say what parts of the pictures he likes and which parts he or she doesn't like. And if the user uh, does that, then we'll sort of find a way to stitch all the pieces together so it actually looks like a picture, right? So here you go. This looks like a picture. It's not, right? It's a piecing together of other pictures, uh, but it looks like a picture that you would have taken. So this is now, again, 2004 SIGGRAPH. And we've used the technology in a lot of different parts of Microsoft, but I want to highlight something which you know, was a, a TV commercial that we, we've been running in the United States. I don't know if it's run here or not, uh, but this is about uh, something that's now in Windows Live that uses this technology. It's called Windows Live Photo Fuse. And I'll just show you the video for that. Can you put the sound on from the laptop? I'm sticking an action figure into Hunter's ear. And Here, I'm going to back up so we can. 
Okay, so we've got Jen texting. Cody's sticking an action figure into Hunter's ear. And Joe, what are you doing? Trying to get the action figure out of Hunter's ear. To the cloud. Now I can take all these unruly shots and swap in some smiles. Finally, a photo I can share without ridicule. Windows gives me the family. Nature never could. To the cloud with Windows Live to create and share anywhere. All right, so obviously it sounds like you guys didn't see that ad. Uh, it was running a lot of football games in the United States for a while. Uh, but the, the, the key element there is you could see the PhotoFuse technology had been adapted to, to that product. Obviously the user interface was changed dramatically, uh, but, but the basic ideas were carried over. And of course a lot of the underlying work in computer vision had been carried over. Now there are a couple of things I'll, I'll just remark here that's, that, that are interesting. You know, here, there you see kind of a progression of technology. But we started our, our computer vision group uh, back in the, in the mid-1990s, long before there was any part of Microsoft that could conceivably have used the technology that came from it. So this is, again, an example of a very long-term basic research commitment that then yields to the creation of a technology which then moves into many places, in this particular case, into a, into a consumer product anybody could use. Let me give you some, another area um, but again, kind of a surprising result. So we, we've been doing machine learning in Microsoft Research for a long time. And we've, we've introduced into our products things like neural networks, hit a Markov model, support vector machines. In fact, we did a lot of the basic work that made support vector machines practical uh, in this field. Uh, but as, you know, as the years have gone on, we've, we've, we've found that, it, that the, while these technologies are great and we still use them a lot, uh, they, they have issues um, in terms of ease of use uh, to tackle various kinds of problems. They, they t typically uh, make it very hard to, to take your knowledge of a domain and incorporate it into the, into the model. So I'll just give you a quick, you know, this is the quick uh, 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 lecture on, in Bayes' theorem here just so you get a sense of it. So if you think about the, the, the idea of how do we learn from statistical information. You know, here's an example using Bayes' algorithm, that, and, and Bayes' formula is right below there, you know, where you look at sort of the fundamental prior distribution, you, you look at, take the likelihood function, and you figure out what the, the posterior distribution might look like. Right? So this is one of the most fa basic concepts that's used in, in machine learning. And of course, you can, you can build on that you know, the, the posterior distribution can become a prior distribution. I, I, I can learn more, uh, which is the new likelihood function, and then I get a, a more refined posterior distribution. So that's my lecture in Bayes' theorem. Um, so I want to, we've taken advantage of that. We've also been adding sort of domain knowledge, and there's this notion in the machine learning space over the last few years where we can take what are called graphical models that incorporate domain knowledge about the relationships between things and then, and then use the, the, the Bayesian approach, use the Bayesian inference you know, to, to leverage that uh, and to be able to learn more from it. So here's an example where you know, we're basically saying you know, if somebody understands math and is good at math, you know, and you know, you know, how does that sort of predict whether they're going to be good at geometry or good at algebra? Right, so, so how, you know, can I infer from knowledge of algebra or knowledge of, of geometry you know, how good someone might be at math? Those are basic ideas. All right, so that's a way of capturing domain knowledge. Now, you can use this in a lot of different ways, and we've been incorporating this into our products. So in particular, when you use a search engine, when you use a social network, you know, when you're using a movie rating service, and we have aspects of this in all of our products, uh, you're using these kinds of machine learning approaches and algorithms today because what you're doing is you're saying, I can sense things like user clicks and playlists and ratings, and I, what, what I really want to infer is, um, you know, what search results should I give people? What are people's shared tastes? And what movies should I suggest to them? So you want to sense things about the world, and using the, the learned model that you have from the world, you want to then be able to to solve some problem. 
you know, like do a better search entry. So in particular, one of the things that we, we used these ideas and these technologies for was uh, uh, when we came out with uh, uh, Halo 3, we wanted to create a, a way for people to be able to play with each other that were of similar skill. And of course, it's a very complicated environment for, for generating similar skill because there's so many people playing at one time. And the notions of winning and losing are, 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 are a little abstract. Because you're, it's a question of, you know, did you die? Did you not die? Did your whole team win? So there's a bunch of things going on there. So we needed to build statistical models of people's skill so that we could, on the fly, be able to connect them together uh, and, and, and have that new experience. So we, this uh, our research group in Cambridge, England, came up with something that we eventually called true skill, which was to use Bayesian inference in much the way I just described, you know, to be able to match people uh, of similar skills. And I'll just give you a sense here of, of what we're doing. So here is an example where, you know, I may have uh, some probability, so I may, I may have some notion of, of how good people are based on some number of games that they've played. And here, Sniper Eye, you know, has played a lot of games. So I've got a pretty good idea of how good Sniper Eye is. So that's a very sharp distribution. You know, I've got a relatively low uh, probability, I, I, I relatively little data about Sully, so uh, again, it's a Gaussian distribution that represents a skill, but it's, it's a, a relatively broad distribution. Now, as these people play, let's say that uh, Sully comes out first and, and Sniper Eye second and, and Dr. Slow Play comes out third, I can dynamically adjust those, those probability curves, those Gaussians, uh, and use that to represent my new notion of how good those people are. And the, the key insight here is that at no point do I have a number that says how good any of those people are. It's, I'm, I'm always maintaining that Gaussian distribution because I always want to be able to represent the uncertainty in my knowledge. So again, this is something we worked on with the product teams. It, it's in um, Xbox Live. It's actually one of the things that uh, I, we know our customers really like about the service is that they can, on average, play with people that are of similar skills. And we've extrapolated from, from these ideas and these approaches to build tools um, that can be broadly used to, do, to build these kinds of of graphical models and, and, and inference networks. So there's this tool called Infra.net, which is being used both inside of Microsoft, but it's also available for people to download for free and use uh, within Visual Studio. And the idea behind it is it gives you a way of writing programs. And this is a, an example of exactly an Infra.net program that would do what TrueSkill does for Halo. So this is how simple it actually can be. It actually took the real, we didn't have this tool when we, when we did that original work, and it took the product group six months to write the code, right? Um, so it gives you a sense of now, we've been able to abstract that. Finally, I'm gonna use a, an example that's very recent uh, that can give you a sense of, of the, you know, the impact that basic research can have in creating a product. So uh, a, few, uh, a couple of years ago, we announced something called Project Natal. And there was an internal code name that we used externally that, that, that was, the idea behind it was pretty simple, which was, what if we could just get rid of game controllers? Just get rid of them. And just have the computer know what you were doing and use that to control games. So I'll just give you a sense here of, what that's intended to look like. Right, so this, in some sense, was the dream. This is what we wanted to do. This is obviously an example of people actually doing it. Okay, here we go. Nice. But the key notion here is, is how do you basically build real-time 3D computer vision um, into a, a game device that sells for a few hundred dollars and that can be in anybody's home? Now, if anybody's in the field of computer vision knows that that's always been kind of a dream of the field to be able to do that, not so much directed at game consoles, but just to be able to do real-time computer vision and have it be broadly available. My own PhD thesis, you know, back in the ancient days was actually in, in 3D computer vision. So we work closely 
with uh, our, our, the PROC team came to us and said, you know, this is our dream, we have some basic technology, but there are a lot of fundamental issues that we can't solve. And, and they, they knew that we'd been working in this area for, for a number of years. And so what I'm going to do now is, is show you a little clip of the, that talks a little bit about that, you know, how that research collaboration went and what some of the, the advantages of it were. Until now, if you wanted to measure the movements of parts of somebody's body, you'd need some kind of a device like a remote or a marker. But now, with Natal, the body itself is the input device. Project Natal allows you to control your character, your games, your entertainment experiences through movements of your body. This is the dream of every researcher, taking their blue skies research and seeing it being shipped to millions of people. Folks in my group come from all walks of life, from musicians to artists to algorithmic developers to researchers to product people. And the way that we incubate is essentially to actually embrace all of these different work styles. The first time that you discover something new that you love. That's what the first moment was like when I walked up to the sensor, gestured, and saw that come to life on the screen. We knew we had something when we took the first demos that were using the skeletal tracking technology and we actually had people using every part of their body. Not only were they smiling, but they said, hey, I was actually there. One of the brilliant things is that the 3D camera for the first time is going to be available. That gives you the three-dimensional information about the distance to every point on the body. But it doesn't actually give you an interpretation of where the limbs are, what the angles of the joints are. So for that, we need to build software. What Natal does is it evaluates effectively trillions of body configurations every frame. We've made it do that 30 times a second. The person playing with Project Natal doesn't need to change their actions or change their behaviors to fit the technology. Natal technology actually changed itself to fit the way that the player plays. I think this is one of the most successful applications of, of machine learning and computer vision that's ever been deployed. We should absolutely expect the unexpected. It's 50% hardware, 50% software. The beauty is that we have the ability to tie those together in a magical experience. From the technology side, our goal is just to make that absolutely seamless. You act, it understands. The idea of using your body as a controller, the idea of controlling things with your voice, the idea of connecting with players like we've never connected before. Suddenly, that white sheet of paper in front of me was filled with ideas. The opportunity is to delight consumers, to make our art form more accessible to a broader audience. We've given you a ticket to the coolest party and given you a megaphone to shout out and to interact with the people around you. So what was interesting is, you know, this was something that where, you know, it was a, it was a, really the product team coming to us, you know, looking for, you know, really solving some very significant hard problems to make this work, you know, and and there was a lot of risk associated with that for them, you know, uh, as as well as for us, into being able to bring something like this to market, but because we had built a tremendously strong research organization. We had the people and the expertise to be brought to bear exactly when the product team needed it. It allowed us to ship this product and the, you know, uh, the Microsoft Connect system became this, over this last Christmas, the fastest selling consumer electronic product in history. So it's the fastest selling consumer electro electronic product that's, that's ever made it out the gate. Uh, and that's just a tremendous amount of impact, even to a company as large as Microsoft, um, in, again, because of that fundamental basic research capability. Now, people ask me, like, how did, you know, when did you know this was going to be, like, a really big thing? And, of course, it always kind of looked cool, but I, I think I sort of had the aha moment when I saw my, my two youngest kids, uh, who had, now they're 10 and 12, they were... Uh, nine and eleven at the time, uh, they were on. We were on the beta. They were playing with it, and I realized that they were having just as much fun 
celebrating after they'd won as they'd had winning. Because they would jump up and down and, 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 and celebrate, and the character on the screen would do exactly the same thing. And it was this sense that they had just projected themselves into this virtual environment and were part of it. Uh, and, and that physical connection, the sort of visceral emotional connection was made. And it was a huge impact on them. You know, and I think this is really the, you know, one of the things that Connect has done is it hasn't just become a very successful product for Microsoft, but it has changed people's perspective, perspectives, changed people's perceptions of what computers are capable of doing. Not just in the you know, outside world of ordinary people, it's changed the research community's perspectives. Now, I was just at Carnegie Mellon uh, this last weekend, and the number of projects there that were using Connect was pretty stunning. I mean, people are suddenly realizing, oh, wait a minute, computers can, can really actually see now in a fundamental way. So I'm going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop, step through really quickly and show you one last thing. So we're doing a lot of work, you know, uh, and to some extent you're going to hear more about this at different points of today. Uh, we're, going, we're doing a lot of work in areas like healthcare, environment, energy, and education. Um, here are just some examples, you know, working in hydrology. These are all examples of projects we've worked on, you know, with people in the research community. Um, Great Barrier Reef, working on all sorts of different diseases. Uh, we're working on, on, on finding a solution to AIDS. And the interesting thing here is that we're actually using spam filtering techniques to help design vaccines. And this is an example of the merging of fields that's been going on. So I'm not going to push on that too much. The last thing I'm going to show you is, is, is uh, an example, and there's actually a version of this that's in the demo room, which is the work we've done to sort of bring the, the world and, the, and space to people. So going back into the 1990s, we did something called, uh, what was really called, originally called TerraServer, it's now called Microsoft Research Maps. It's really the first large-scale digital mapping facility that was available on the Internet. It's the first terabyte database available on the Internet. It was done originally by Jim Gray. Here's just some examples, some images. That morphed over the years into something uh, that was looking outward, first working with the Sloan Digital Sky survey people to produce the sky server and eventually building something called the worldwide telescope and uh, just gives you a sense of that and we've worked with nasa we've incorporated incredible imagery from mars and things of that sort but i specifically want to show you um, a quick demo of to give you just a sense of how you can bring data into this kind of visualization tool in order to be able to see, let people see things in a way they've never been able to see before. So what we're looking at here is the visible universe. This is one million galaxies um, as mapped by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And although it's really hard to tell in, with this kind of a projector, I'm afraid, uh, you know, all the galaxies are rendered in their appropriate colors and whatnot. They mostly look white for you, so uh, I'll apologize for that. So imagine you're, you know, city outside the universe. Now you're able to see the, effectively, all the visible universe as it would look from the outside. So that's what you're looking at. We're getting a nice 3D view. Now we're going to zoom in closer and closer to our own world. Now, what's interesting here is you just saw a million galaxies, each one with 100 billion to 200 billion stars. We've now gone through the, the Milky Way, and we're getting to our own solar system. But in that original image, we weren't a speck in a speck. We weren't even a speck in a speck in a speck. Right? We're so tiny, you know, that we're like a speck in a speck in a speck in a speck. You know, down that, in, that, in that image. This is the solar system. And the little red line there is the orbit of Mars. And the two uh, collections of yellow on the side are all the asteroids that are caught in the Lagrange points of Jupiter. Uh, this image is a representation of all the objects in our solar system 
bigger than a school bus. 500,000 objects. So I'm going to keep moving on. Now you can use that, that that's a visualization of, the, of space, but we can visualize scientific data as well. So this is an example of some work that was done by um, Curtis Wong and some of the people that, that he works with, where they've taken earthquake data from the U.S. Geological Service for the entire planet for about an 18-month period, and then they've created a visualization of that data, which I think is quite stunning. So here you see all the red represents earthquakes that have happened from January 3rd, 2009 to January, uh, July 12th of 2010. And we're kind of looking at taking a view now. And we're centering under Puerto Rico. And you can see this is a time lapse of the earthquakes. And you can see all the earthquakes that have, that have happened there. Now, it, you, it went by kind of fast. But I can stop this and poke around. And this was the massive earthquake in Haiti that caused so much damage. Now, one thing you notice right away, and in particular you notice it if, if, as, as I sort of move, move so you can see it rendered uh, fully in, in perspective, is that it's a very shallow quake, which is why it did so much damage. And you see all these other quakes that go, go down into the Earth's crust? Um, the, the quake that caused so much damage in Haiti was very shallow, and there was a whole sequence of them. So those big red dots that you see, that's actually multiple quakes all, all close together. I'm going to move now to the um, coast of South America um, near Chile. And again, do the same thing, give you a sense of what happened during that period. Now, we're going to also do another time lapse. In, but one thing to note is that for about 40 years before this, this area actually had a relatively few earthquakes compared to other parts of South America. Uh, but obviously, you're just about to see it, there was suddenly an enormous sequence of events. Uh, that was the great quakes that, uh, that did so much damage. Uh, and you know, there were towns, major cities that were moved, where parts of them were moved 10 feet in those quakes. Uh, but you can see it rendered really well there. And lastly, th this, this gives you a, a real sense of the, you know, how the earthquakes follow the subduction zones and the plates of the earth. This is the fast subduction zones that are, that are north of New Zealand. Now this was obviously the data uh, was before the big quakes that hit New Zealand. But you can see that some of these go 500 kilometers down into the earth. These are the deepest earthquakes that are measured. Uh, and again, this is a way of, of seeing and, and, and understanding what's happening to the Earth uh, that is interesting and unique. And get, again, think of this as a form of visualization that can be used for education, it can be used by scientists, it can be used you know, for uh, trying just simply to get a better understanding of what's happening around us. So with that, I'm going to, to stop because I think my time is up. Uh, but what I wanted to convey here was the fact that, that we have made, you know, we've made a bet at Microsoft on long-term fundamental basic research. It is a bet that has paid off very handsomely in our success as a company, uh, but also I think it's paid off in the impact that we've had as a, as, as a research organization on the science that's going on in the field of computer science. Thank you.